Working together to make a better community. We can create a brighter day. Welcome to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis. And my guest today is Saul Mamakwa, from, uh, is an MPP from Kiu... Kiwetinung. Kiwetinung. Yeah. It's the newest riding in yes. Northern Ontario. Welcome onto the show, Saul. Yeah, glad to be here, Steve. So tell me a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up? Uh, I was born in Sulikot, uh, and but I uh, grew up in a small community uh, in Kingfisher Lake. It's a you know community of about 600 people. Okay. It's a flying community, so uh, we're the OG Cree, so I grew up there, uh, you know, uh, up until I had to go to high school. So uh, my parents, uh, my dad ran a uh, Hudson's Bay Company store, and um, he always took me out on the land, uh, hunting, fishing, trapping, those type of activities. So I grew up in that way, so, uh, uh, so I remember the days when, uh, you know, when we were... Uh, when we had, well, I remember when we first had hydro, which was in the early 80s, and then I think it was 1987 when we had the uh, airport run away and run away there, and uh, we had running water in 1994. So it doesn't seem that long ago, but it's, uh, you know, the flying communities are uh, kind of like that. And so <clears throat> that's kind of where I grew up. And, um, you know, uh, and then, of course, I had to leave for high school, and I came back, and then, uh, you know, did some work, and then eventually uh, moved to Sulikot. So uh, where did you end up going to high school? I was up in uh, uh, a little place called Sterling Lake. It's a, uh, a Mennonite school, but also a residential school. Okay. Uh, and I did that for two years, and I did go to school in um, uh, Sulikot as well. It used to be Queen Elizabeth District High School, so that's where I graduated school, and yeah. And so what, what, where'd you go after school? You say you, you went back I, home? I, I went back home. Uh, I went back home as, you know, like did, uh, I did some, um, I, was, uh, I was a community education director. I went to education program. And I did that for uh, just over a decade. And I eventually, uh, you know, I was basically hiring teachers, running this, you know, hiring teachers and running the school, make sure that... Uh, uh, the principal had the resources to be able to run the school and then, uh, you know, creating a, you know, the distance ed learning program, not creating, but also running the distance ed program and also, you know, creating a, uh, you know, um, high school program, which was uh, up to grade nine because we don't, we don't have high schools. So, mm -hmm. so that was a, a unique experience. And then eventually I moved to Sulikot and that eventually, you know, uh, uh, I did some work in the tribal council. As you know, uh, tribal councils, um, you know, uh, First Nation communities uh, uh, organize themselves through tribal councils to um, provide second level services such as, you know, tech services, education services, health services, finance services for communities and uh, communities organize themselves through tribal councils to get those second level services. So I was at that level and then um, eventually I switched over to health and um, uh, so that was a learning curve to go from education to health, and uh, so I got involved with some of the um, the regional uh, uh, organizations, I guess, within Sulaco, like whether it's the Sulaco Minneapolis Health Center, and also the Sulaco First Nations Health Authority, and then there was a Sulaco Regional Physician Services Inc. So I got really involved with the uh, <coughs> with the healthcare system in the north and I began to understand, you know, how, um, how should I say it, how, uh, you know, when you are on reserve, the, how the federal program health runs and when you go off reserve, going into a solar health system, how the provincial system takes over and somehow how the systems were, how should I say it, uh, there were gaps in it and that people were, you know, uh, you know, uh, how should I say it, uh, you know, falling through the cracks, you know, with their health, with their lives even. So, you know, I, I began to understand that. So it, uh, it kind of took me to a where, uh, whereby a few years later, you know, like, you know, all these issues were coming up and, uh, and that was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, people uh, paying uh, <laughs> their health and their, uh, again, their lives through that system. So... I began to get involved with uh, 
you know, Nishinaabeski Nation, who uh, represents 49 First Nations in Northern Ontario. And, you know, I began to got, get, get involved in health. I did that for about, uh, maybe, uh, maybe two, three years, um, kind of advising the leadership on some of the processes, uh, some of the gaps that were there. And, uh, and then I understood how the provincial system worked and I understood how, um, how I guess, the federal system also worked uh, within, the, within the healthcare system. And so, and then I, obviously, uh, you know, it was around early, early uh, 2018, you know, when, you know, uh, uh, when, um, when the NDP reached out to me and started having conversations on what, you know, if I would be interested in, and it wasn't until um, probably around a month before the elections or a month, uh, about a month and a half before the elections when I decided, you know, right, I'll, I'll give that a try. So, oh, my gosh. So it, uh, it was a very interesting uh, time, and, uh, you know, like, uh, especially when, um, when the other parties had, um, you know, had selected their candidates already, you know, Mayor of Solicode, who I work with already, had worked with within the healthcare system, and also... You know, Chief Clifford Ball, you know, running for the PCs. And uh, so we already had been working together and, you know, and I, I didn't, uh, uh, you know, it was kind of weird that way when uh, we were running all against each other. But I know, you know, I think, uh, you know, I didn't, I just anticipated, uh, you know, that it would, you know, no matter who got in, like, you know, we'd be representing our people. So it, it just kind of worked out that way. Uh, we were uh, kind of, uh, some people were uh, saying that, you know, that we ran the friendliest campaign <laughs> in the election. So, yeah, it was an interesting experience for sure. Yeah. So, in a way, your background really has a lot to do with health and a lot to do with education, of course, yeah. which are some of the biggest items on the provincial budget. Yes. Now, let's go back to the education piece. So I had a guest on uh, the show last year that mentioned that 65% of the Indigenous kids in the district of Thunder Bay didn't graduate high school. What's been your experience and where are those gaps? What, uh, where are those gaps in education? You know, uh, you have to understand, I think, uh, one of the things like when we look at the, uh, the funding uh, that communities get in the federally mm -hmm. on reserve, uh, you know, like sometimes uh, it's not equivalent to what, what the provincial system gets. And uh, I mean, there's good things that are happening in our communities, like mm -hmm. uh, certainly like when you, like say for example, uh, you know, when um, uh, in the north, uh, in my community, uh, um, they built that school in 1973. And um, I think struct the structure itself, uh, when we talk about infrastructure, um, you know, that, that that's the same school that they're using today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, like when you talk about the walls are, you know, like they're using two by fours, like that's the wall. And it, when it gets cold, uh, they have to close the school. So there, there's a number of examples that, you know, on why uh, sometimes, uh, you know, whether it's uh, education, whether it's uh, uh, writing, writing and math, like sometimes they're behind. And it's just because of the, the system that, uh, that are there and um, like one of the things I've learned um, you know over the years is um, you know uh, as a First Nations person like I used to say that the, the, the systems are broken and one of the things I've learned over the years and uh, you know with the funding when we talk about child welfare when we talk about education health it's uh, you know these are colonial systems like as a First Nations person like I mean when you talk about Indian Act when you talk about the reserve systems as well like uh, you know we're gonna need to take a short little break but we're going to come right back to hear more about the challenges in our north. Please stay with us. Working together to make a better community. We can create a brighter day. Working together to make a better community. We can create a brighter day. Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guest today is the MPP from Kiwetanun, Kiwetanun uh, Sol Mamukwa. Welcome back, Sol. Yeah, good, good to be here. We 
touched on a bunch of things, uh, but maybe let's start with, so you represent a new riding in Northern Ontario, first time yeah. election in 2018. Tell us a little bit about your riding. So Kiwet uh, Nung means North and Ojibwe or Ojibwe. And uh, uh, the, the previous government had created this riding uh, basically north of uh, uh, the tracks, uh, the sea and tracks in uh, Kenora. And um, Red Lake, Sulacout, Pickle Lake, all the way to, uh, yeah, Pantook, which is known as Fort Hope as well, all the way to Fort Severn to the Hudson's Bay. So it's the biggest riding in Ontario. And uh, out of the 124 ridings, and it's about 294,000 square kilometers. So, and, um, but also uh, when we talk about uh, population-wise, it's the smallest riding. It's about 33,000 people in the riding and about 65% are indigenous people in those ridings. And the unique uh, thing about uh, the riding itself is I have 24 flying communities that I represent. So. So that could uh, 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 that could be a challenge whereby you have to travel to these communities where the constituents are. So, and there's three, uh, you know, like uh, you know, I'm Oji Cree, and then there's uh, uh, Crees in Fort Severn, and there's Ojibwe. So I have a uh, uh, twelve uh, linguistic groups that I represent, but also English, right? So, and then of course then uh, you have the, the municipalities as well. So it's a very uh, unique writing and challenging but uh, but also I think what's what's unique about my role as well is uh, you get to actually uh, provide a uh, you know a voice for the north and I, th I don't think they really had a voice in, the, in Queens Park uh, in that sense and because um, you know like even like I say uh, uh, this past uh, last month uh, we did a uh, what we call a uh, uh, pre-budget consultations. I'm part of a committee called the uh, Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs and this is a traveling committee and we toured the north or tour all over Ontario and it was the first time this committee came to Sulaco to hear uh, deputations from you know different people, different organizations from the north and they, they were it was an eye-opening experience for the fellow MPPs that are from southern Ontario and mm -hmm. have never been in the north. So we, we are actually in Thunder Bay too, and it was the same thing, you know. Like, uh, and that's one of the things I've realized that um, since being in Queens Park, that uh, the uh, that decision makers at Queens Park don't know about us, and I know some of the issues that we hear, like whether it's Thunder Bay, whether it's Dryden, whether it's Kenora, Red Lake. Plus, you know, uh, the, the flying communities in the north, some of them, the needs are very um, uh, worse. Some of the issues are far worse, like the challenges, barriers are worse up there. But it's just a matter of, like, I, I'm starting to understand how, uh, you know, we need to work together as municipalities, as uh, townships, as uh, First Nations to come to bring these services closer to home. and. Uh, uh, and that's one of the things I've realized in my experience in the last uh, year and a half, just uh, how sometimes uh, we're not given that voice as, as the, for the North. So it's a very unique experience uh, and it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, I just don't represent Kiewitnung, but I also represent the North to being the, the voice uh, of the North uh, to Queen's Park. So it's interesting because here in Thunder Bay, oftentimes we think, oh, Toronto doesn't understand the North. And, but in a way, we may not very well understand the North that, that you're from. It's another 200 miles and then plus yes. going North. And, and, and there's big differences. What, what, what do you see as some of those differences? I think, uh, you know, like I think, um, you know, access to, like, say, um, access to uh, healthcare services, uh, you know, like, uh, is one thing, but also even access, you know, airports is a very critical thing for the communities up north, especially the, the 24 communities I represent, uh, you know, when they have uh, runways that are gravel, you know, gravel runways, and uh, and uh, it's their lifeline to, to the outside, right? So we don't understand that sometimes when we talk about uh, the cost of living in uh, these flying communities such as uh, I was in one community just last a few days ago and uh, uh, the cost of gas 
uh, was uh, $3.09. A liter. A liter. And then there's another community that's $4.19. That's how much they per, pay for a liter. And when, I, when, I'm down, when I'm in Thunder Bay, you know, uh, gas is 127. And when you're down in southern Ontario, you know, it's 109 or 107, right? So, you know, like uh, we just don't understand that sometimes, you know, how, uh, how we, um, uh, how, how the differences are in like cost of food, you know. Well, I, I've thought about that difference around education. And, and you mentioned how oftentimes in the, some of the northern communities, they get less funding per student for school than we would here, say, in Thunder Bay. Yeah. And yeah. yet, the costs of goods and services could be twice or, or three times as much. Yes, as a, exactly. And I, th I know, like, example is, um, you know, like, uh, there's not too many communities that have high schools. So communities have to come to Thunder Bay or Sulaco or Dryden to attend their high school uh, education. Like, you know, like they're leaving at, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old. You know, like, and then do that for four years, and then that's a very, uh, uh, you know, like, and I hear, and uh, when I'm down in Toronto, uh, you hear about this uh, in September and uh, end of August, you know, oh, my uh, university, university student is finally leaving or is leaving for, you know, it's just a difference, right? Like, you know, like, yeah. uh, so I think uh, that's one of the things about, uh, you know, uh, when you see kids here uh, from the north that are attending Thunder Bay, you know, uh, you know, it, uh, everybody should be looking after them. Like, I mean, they, they, it's a big challenge. Like, I've experienced it. Like, I left home at uh, 13 years old, and, you know, you miss your family, you miss, uh, you know, like, uh, your friends, and you miss, uh, you know, the things that you like to do in the community, such as hunting, fishing, because that's how you know, we have a lot of access to uh, uh, lands and the lands that are there, the rivers. And, and I think uh, one of the challenges, too, is... Um, of course, uh, access to clean drinking water, and I know some of the communities have had these uh, boil water advisories in the north. And I know one community that I've been visiting for the last few years, and you know, this year, uh, this month actually will be 26 years of you know <laughs> boil water advisory in the community. And you know, and when I'm at Queens Park, and I um, you know when I want water, and I'm in the chamber now, wave over a uh, uh, you know page, and I said you know. I'll, I'll give a, you know, if I need one or two, and it'll give me water. And it's not like that for that community. So, like, we don't understand that sometimes, how, uh, you know, like, uh, how, um, I guess, uh, we take these for granted, mm -hmm. you know, clean drinking water. And it's, so that's why we need to work together on, like, some of these issues. It's about, you know, humanity it's about uh, working together it's that's you know like that's that's who I am and that's what uh, you know as an MPP as a politician that's uh, we, what we need to address that and we need to work together and uh, and I think that's one of the things that we need to you know like whether it's the townships and uh, whether it's the municipalities uh, First Nations need to work together uh, to get access to the equ equitable access to these services whether it's healthcare like I know one of the things that we've been hearing is, like example, is uh, mental health services. We need to take another short break. We'll be right back, right back, and uh, please stay with us. We're going to find out more about some of our challenges in the northern part of Ontario. Working together to make a better community. We can create a brighter day. Working together to make a better community We can create a brighter day Welcome back to Community Conversations. I'm your host, Steve Mantis, and my guest today is Saul Mamakwa, who's our MPP from Kiwetnung. Yes. <laughs> kind of. <Yeah>. Kiwetnung, yeah. <laughs> so, Saul... You're talking about a lot of the challenges that are faced by folks in, in, in the communities in your riding, and, and you're talking about how we need to work together. Do you have examples of, of how we've been successful in the past that might be able to help us, or, or suggestions? Of how, how do we work together? What, what, do we, what does that look like? One of the examples that I, uh, uh, I'll go back to Sulaco, uh, I mean, go back to health. Uh, back in uh, <coughs> traditionally, like uh, Sulaco has had 
two hospitals. One was a federal hospital, uh, and one was a provincial hospital. But back in uh, 1997, they were amalgamated the hospitals. And uh, there were four parties that were involved. Uh, one of them was the federal government, the provincial government, and then the municipality, and also First Nations. So uh, they call it a four-party four agreement. And uh, what it, that entailed is to get a, a, a new hospital uh, for that uh, for the community for the north, but also for the town and uh, the municipality of Solcote and the surrounding communities. Because so, there are no hospitals in the small communities. Eh? No, there's no. no. There are no hospitals. They, uh, so they, Sioux Lookout is servicing all these communities. Yeah. So the way they structure it, the way the federal government structures uh, the hospitals. I mean the. They have nursing stations or clinics whereby they have nurses running those stations, right? So uh, if you need any uh, specialty services, sometimes you'll come to Sulacote or Thunder Bay. So, but anyway, what ended up happening is and they signed that agreement in 1997, and then uh, I think it was 2010 when they had a grand opening for the, a brand new hospital, which was cost about $130 million. And that's an example of... Uh, a way when we work together uh, to come, you know, uh, bring um, uh, services programs close to their home. I'm not saying that it's the best system, but I, I mean it's uh, it's just an example on what can happen when you um, when you uh, when you bring services or when you work together. And you know, like I mean, I I told you about the, some of the. Uh, uh, the deputations I heard in the committee, like an uh, example is mental health services, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, like, and I think that's an example as well, like that we can work together on when we talk about uh, mental health for children and adolescents and, uh, you know, and, and it's a really important uh, to ensure that we work together and make sure that we bring those services closer to home. And uh, whether it's Sulacot, whether it's Thunder Bay, and uh, so, so I think that's an example, and you know, like whether it's uh, highways, like there's so many things that we can work on together. And, uh, and and do you see that happening? Do you see that that, that cooperation <coughs> taking place? I mean, there's some uh, there's some municipalities that have uh, uh, signed friendship agreements with uh, uh, with First Nations on and working together on uh, uh, whether it's economic development or working in it's a uh, relationship protocols on how they work together and. So it's a uh, like uh, it's something that we need to move towards, and uh, it's all about. Uh, I mean, I mean, as First Nations, uh, we've we've been here for you know uh, thousands of years, and uh, you know, like, uh, and then sometimes it's, um, uh, and then we will continue to be here, and uh, all you got to do is just work with us, and uh, um, and I know, uh, like, say for example, like say like any like say housing. Housing is an issue up north, right? So uh, there's overcrowding, there's, uh, the, and then sometimes it has an impact on whereby if there's not enough housing in the community, people will move down. And, and there's not enough social housing, Solicode will feel it, Dryden will feel it, Solicode will feel it, even Thunder Bay is feeling it. So, you know, how do we work together on make sure that, you know, both federal and provincial governments respond to what's happening in our area, as an example, right? So that's why you see, uh, sometimes you see a lot of uh, uh, our First Nations in Thunder Bay or in Solicote because, you know, it's, uh, because it's a big issue. And it's housing is, affordable housing is an issue in our area. And, uh, and that's what I mean. How do we work together? And, and, and the other services, education and health care? Yeah. I think are, are other draws that we have, certainly. Yes, there's certainly lots of students that come to Thunder Bay, um, also Sulicote, but also for healthcare, right? I mean, like say, if you're on dialysis, uh, if somebody from my home community comes to Thunder Bay for dialysis, they, they have to live here. And mm -hmm. how do we give them proper uh, transportation? How do we give them proper, uh, you know, housing to be able to, because they have to leave home. And so... How do we ensure uh, that uh, the, the systems that are here are uh, service? Uh, the services are provided them, and and then that those are the things that we need to work on. And and I know uh, you know. And and so you've introduced the private members bill, in into the legislature in Ontario. Does that cover some of that? Well, I think it's a uh, what it is is a United Nations, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, UNDRIP, perhaps it's it's called and. Uh, uh, and it, uh, what it is, is uh, to align 
the rights of indigenous peoples with the provincial law. And I know uh, uh, it's going to take some while to, to do it, but right now it's at uh, the second, re it passed the second reading and uh, the government today, that the government in, uh, in, uh, in power today has to send it to committee, which they haven't, and it has to come back and get the, uh, uh, get past third reading. So that's, uh, I did that back in uh, March and so it's almost been a year now, it's about 10 months now. So. So I have to uh, kind of reach out to uh, organizations and uh, individuals uh, on how they can move, press the government and make sure that they move that forward. And this bill is not something to be implemented like, you know, within, you know, next few years. This is, you know, take some time, you know, like whether it's 10, 20, 30 years to move forward and that make sure that the Ontario laws align with the UNDRA. And so that's uh, International Human Rights Declaration. Yeah. Are, are do we see some of the laws already line up with that or certainly I think uh, you know certainly like I think uh, it's about equity it's about equality and uh, you know like uh, and I think it's about the government recognizing of who we are and uh, recognizing the the unique the uniqueness of who we are and I mean <laughs> I mean I can say that uh, you know we've been here for thousands of years and you know like uh, and I know that uh, sometimes I used to, like an example is, uh, I used to, uh, uh, <coughs> I used to call my communities remote and then, uh, and then uh, I got a, one area came to me one time and told me, he said, you know, we're not remote, it's Toronto, it's Ottawa that's remote because <laughs> cause we've been here thousands of years and I don't know how long I've always been there, but it's just, uh, you know, like, uh, but going back to the question, but I think it's, uh, it's a, uh, you know, like it's, uh, you know, like uh, it's kind of like uh, recognizing us who we are as indigenous peoples and, and they just have to work with us and, you know, like. You were pretty much out of time. If people want to get in touch, what's the best way to do that? Uh, I have a, a, a Toronto office, uh, you know, like that. I have a legislative assistant over there and uh, also I have an office in Solcote. Uh, both of those numbers, uh, somebody should be answering. We'll put them up on the screen. Saul, thanks so much for coming on the show today. I'd like to have you back again and uh, explore these issues further. Yes, right. glad to be here. And uh, thanks to the audience, and uh, please stay safe. And we always look for your input on our Facebook page, Community Conversations. Working together to make a better community. We can create a brighter day.